Okay, percussion here. Now for some solo percussion instruments, I really like Spitfire Audio's Hans Zimmer percussion. It's been very good to me, and you'll notice I do actually don't have any plugins for this bit here. Let's listen to a dole, which is actually an Indian drum. Clipped just a little bit there at the end, but it's got some nice smack to it. These are Surtos, and you'll notice that I'm starting to do a little bit of compression. Actually, it's a pretty aggressive compressor from the looks of it. And I'm starting to tame out some of the low end here. We always want to be careful of making sure that we don't have frequencies that sort of accumulate over the course of a piece that we're writing. And I've just found that if I cut a little bit around 100 hertz and boost just a little bit to get some more smack, I get some good results. And you'll notice I actually had a bit of a roll in there. A lot of percussion libraries will have pre-recorded performances. And you can actually control the dynamics of it with the mod wheel. Common with percussion libraries. This is yet another one from Hans Zimmer Library. This is a Paper June. Nice and punchy down there. No extra plugs on this one. These are bucket drums. And you guys, what you're gonna notice is I don't add any reverb to this because some libraries come with interchangeable mic positions. My one cautionary note about Spitfire audio stuff is that they tend to have a lot of room sound just baked already into their samples. And the bummer about stuff like that is that you don't have as much creative control down the line with how you wanna shape your sound. So like, check this out. If I go ahead and I turn off a close, uh, if I turn on a close mic, and turn the tree microphone, heck, let's just turn it off. You're still getting a lot of hall noise. You hear all that decay, all that room tone decay? So that's something to be, you know, at least a little bit aware of with a library like this. And that's, of course, why I don't have any reverb. Season to taste, you guys. Okay. For these next couple, let's talk about including some what I call inflated realism. So remember on our piano up here, when we took a look at that, how we maybe have had a little bit more reverb than what we needed, but we liked the sound of it because it sounded big and cinematic and larger than life. We can do that with percussion too. Check out this Crusher patch. Again, this is from Hans Zimmer Percussion from Spitfire Audio. But what happens if we add that big Valhalla reverb that we had before to this patch? Okay, so I don't have it added. Let's just go down to add that. So we're adding this huge um, algorithmic reverb to this. Check out what this does to that crusher sound. we get this really cool, long, cinematic tail. And I rather like that, I'm gonna save that. But again, you can manipulate the samples. You can kind of make them your own and create a sound that's larger than life if that's what you like. Snares from Hans Zimmer Percussion. A Little bit of that action in there. We've got some symphobia toms, and I've taken out a little bit of the of the high mid area of the EQ to make sure that there's enough room. We've added some compression, more like a rock drum compressor than anything else, and a little bit of reverb. Nasty. So one thing that you'll notice is that I'm just pulling up a lot of patches that were kind of pre-made by sample producers 
But you guys, one thing that is really important is having a sound that is ownable. And part of doing that is creating sounds or sampling sounds that are either combinations of things that other people have made or are things that you have sampled and made. And I mean, you'll you'll just get to the point where you know a lot of these libraries well enough where you'll be able to hear a composition. You'll be like, oh, I know exactly what library they used. They used Tina Guo cello, or they used that Symphobia string riser. You guys are gonna now start hearing those on television because you heard them here. Um, but what I've done here is I've tried to create something that's a little bit more customized. So I've taken a little bit of the high end out in the EQ. I've added um, what is a sample delay essentially, which kind of offsets the stereo image a little bit. And I have compressed it. And what I've done in the sample side of things here is I've taken those Symphobia toms that I showed you and I've created a contact multi with multi in, uh, multiple instruments loaded up. And I've got that paper June from uh, Spitfire Audio in there. And then I took some samples of some drum toms that I had and I layered that in there. And you guys, by putting these all together, we get a huge percussive sound. And it's a sound that isn't likely to be exactly repeated by another composer. Take a listen. Except without a mistake. Big percussive sound. So again, go ahead and use presets. Go ahead and use um, sample libraries. But try to find creative ways to make them your own as well in a way that allows you to own them. And again, nothing wrong with using default instruments if it can save you a couple hundred bucks and let you take your spouse or your partner out to dinner instead of them saying, are you spending more money on sample libraries? No, my wife is perfect. She's actually never said that to me. Okay, so here we have some timpanis. And these are, again, just coming standard with logic. I didn't purchase these. Okay, let's put that away. And as it tends to be the case with percussion libraries, we have some pre-recorded roles as well. There we go. And again, because it saves me time on orchestration every once in a while, I'll use some Symphobia. And the reason I use Symphobia in this instance, it's actually low strings paired with a timpani. And there are some variations of this patch that actually include some low brass as well. And again, the reason we turn to libraries like this is to save time. That's going to save me time from having to go up and program a string line as well as go down and program a timpani line. This is what it sounds like, and you'll hear why it saves you time. Yeah, there's definitely brass in there. That, that is mislabeled. But again, it saves you time on the orchestration process. Grand Casa, again from Symphobia in this case. Goodness, we have a lot of Symphobia on my template. I should change this up now that I think about it. It's just kind of like a low, low bass drum hit. Now, I'm not going to play through my electronic percussion patches here. Uh, suffice it to say that what I'm using for this is actually some drums from Slate Digital um, called Steven Slate Drums with a little bit of EQing, in this case for the kick, taken out of the high end. But you guys, in like hybrid orchestral writing, what we'll often do is we'll layer electronic percussion in underneath or alongside a lot of the acoustic percussion. So hits like this. Stuff like that we'll layer in with some of our acoustic orchestral percussion. Same thing with electronic snares. Okay, moving along. Okay, here we have some cymbals. And guys, try not to use rock crashes for your orchestral cymbals. You can just tell the difference between like a Zildjian crash and like a big pair of Piotti cymbals. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And honestly, this is just a little bit of compression added to a contact factory library symbol, you guys. It comes standard when you purchase the full version of contact. So I mentioned briefly in one of the previous lessons that there are plenty of you know, $100 libraries and below that I include on my template. This is one of them, you guys. Loops de la Creme, a company I'd never heard of. They do great symbol rolls. Here's one example of a symbol roll. They, I think they have well over a dozen symbols in their pack, though. And again, you can change out the symbol, and it's all mod wheel controlled. So while it's not a traditional percussion instrument per se, I always use drums in my template, you guys. You never, like a trap kit rather, um, or a trap set, and not trap like the bump and bass that you hear out of people's windows in the city. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. not that kind of trap, like traditional drum set trap set. And what I do, generally speaking, is I just have it on my template in case I need it. Again, I'm using... Um, Slate Digital's Steven Slate drums. And let's just go over a quick example of how you might go about programming some drums. So here's a quick look at what I'm using. Little bit of saturation, little bit of selective EQing, but, and a little bit of compression. But what you'll notice is on my kick drum here, right? These are just the effects that I have for my kick. I have a completely different plug-in set up for my snare and my second snare and my toms. So what you're kind of probably deducing by now is that I program my drums and then I split out the MIDI regions. Let's just do a quick example of that. Why not? And goodness, was that playing awful. So we're just going to go ahead and do the old quantize routine and snap these notes to grid. Golly sakes, Will, what were you doing? So essentially, after I've got it recorded, what I would do in a traditional percussion setting is then I would then drag this down, copy it down to all the drum pieces where I have, you know, performances of it. In this instance and what I do for the kick track is I would go through select everything unselect the kick get rid of everything now I've only got kicks in my kick track then I would go to my snare track I would select everything unselect the snares get rid of everything but the snares and now I've only got snares in my snare track this is gonna give you much more control in terms of how you program your drums as you go along moving right along to our melodic synths you guys, there are a million different synthesizer libraries out there. I was just on the phone with a colleague out of New York today, and he was telling me all about this new Juno synthesizer modulator. Suffice it to say, I use a lot of preset synthesizers that come with my DAW. In my case, Alchemy and ES2. But you guys, honestly, there's a million different ones out there, and there's more every single week, it seems. But I use a lot of Alchemy for... Um, uh, for a lot of my synthesizer patches. Here's an arpeggiator. So an arpeggiator, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, I would imagine you are, but it essentially sequences uh, and patterns out notes that you're just holding down as chords. Another alchemy patch. Here we got some whistle cottos, and this is actually sort of a bastardized choral patch that we've taken and done some interesting things to. Ooh, that's inspiring. And actually, that's why we have a template with some sound set up, you guys, so we can just get going and be like, that sounds kind of cool. And again, this is from Olympus Elements from Sound Iron. And actually, now to think about it, I haven't really done anything to it. I've just added a little bit of reverb. Dirty synth bass. And again, this is the ES2, which comes standard with Logic. You don't need to go and purchase a bunch of fancy, expensive synthesizers, you guys.
a little bit of EQ to boost the high end and boost the low end, and a limiter to control any unruly loudness. This is another ES2 patch, you guys. Dirty synth bass. Moving right along here. So this is another default synth. I don't mind default instruments, you guys. If you can get them to sound the way you want to, especially if you start throwing great plugins on them. Okay, this is a good trick. I should show you guys this. So if you put a little bit of a guitar amp on your synthesizers, you are going to get sounds that are gritty and nasty. So take a default synthesizer that comes with your DAW. I know some come with Pro Tools. I'm pretty sure some likely come with Cubase. They may or may not. But what I've done is I've put a guitar head emulator on this synthesizer, done a little tiny bit of saturation, little bit of bit crushing as well. And this is kind of, you remember old chiptune music, 8-bit music in old video games? That's kind of what this makes it sound like. And I've thrown on some filters and done a bunch of different things. You guys, this is where you can start to really make things sound like your own. Oh, okay. And because I've thrown a filter on this, it's going to rise over the course of a couple different bars. So we could kind of have a cool build that sounds like this. That's pretty sick. Synthesizers are where there are fewer rules. Not that you couldn't likely put a guitar amplifier on. I mean, shoot, I've put guitar amplifiers on violins before. So there's really no rules, but synthesizers are where you can start going a little more crazy. <laughs> Kind of an old, vintage, 1980s sounding synth with yet another default patch, you guys. Here we have another alchemy patch with a little bit of EQ, a little bit of compression, and a little bit of reverb. And another important note about synthesizers, you guys, generally this is the way that I work. I had talked a little bit before about the importance of kind of customizing your sounds. I pull open a preset and I start turning knobs until I'm happy with what I get. And the reason I do things that way is quite frankly because then at least you're making a sound a little bit ownable and it's not going to be a sound that everyone else has okay let's go through some impacts i'm going to give you guys a helpful hint here azer x they have a free try version of their library azer x and you can download that and these are huge cinematic hits you guys so i throw a little bit of compressor on there a little bit of compression, rather, on there, and then I threw some Valhalla reverb on there, so check this out. So stuff like this is great to have on your template, especially if you're working on trailers and things like that. We have more of the same, honestly. A lot of these visceral hits are all Azer X. Slammer Impact from Alchemy. Yeah, and that just got a little bit of drum compression on it. Colossus, yet another Alchemy pack, or another Alchemy instrument, rather. And now we're starting to get even more experimental. The thing to remember, you guys, is that so much of orchestral and cinematic music, again, a lot of it almost doubles as sound design. So it's good to have some sort of sound design driven type things in these patches. This is what I call low impact flavoring. Great for drops. Sub crash landing, again, another alchemy patch with a little bit of top end EQ, a little bit of decapitator from sound toys in there, and a little bit of compression as well. Get a nasty drop in there. 
Metal Screech Impact, Alchemy, with a tiny little bit of compression on it. Great for a surprising moment. Good for trailer stuff as well. There's some impacts. All right, we're going to fly through this next little bit here, you guys. We have builds and sweeps, more alchemy stuff. And that is just unadulterated sound design used as music. It's an effect I call compressed air, another alchemy patch. That is alchemy with a filter on it that has a two bar rise. That's great for sort of transitional things. This is another alchemy patch. Same patch as before, just no reverb. This is another ES2 synthesizer. It's great for kind of like heart monitor beeps. And you guys, again, we're feeding our synthesizer through a guitar amplifier with a little bit of reverb and then also a little bit of a low shelf filter. A little bit of pitch bend on there. You can kind of see where you might go with something like that. It's another alchemy patch. We've boosted the low end to give it a little attitude. And we've added some compression as well. Drill whoosh, another alchemy patch with a little bit of compression and a little bit of EQ on there. Dirty Riser. Okay, let's talk about monophonic synthesizers and risers. You talked me into it. You guys, monophonic synthesizers are great because basically, let's talk about monophonic synthesizers to begin with. So mono meaning one, as opposed to poly meaning many. If you have one voice on your synthesizer, and if it is a monophonic synthesizer, only one note can play at a time. Let's turn the glide down so this actually sounds like music. But you hear how the notes don't bleed into one another? It is monophonic, so only one note can play at a time. But what happens if we turn this glide value all the way up here and we play a low note and hold it and then play a high note? Suddenly we have a riser. It's a nice little synthesizer trick. Same thing here. Monophonic synthesizer using to kind of make a dirty sound. And finally, you guys, more so in the sound design realm of things, we have some atmospheres. Just an alchemy patch, nothing else on it. Again, another alchemy patch. What in the world is that? That is sound effects. Glitching machine, that's pretty cool. Forgot about that one. Okay, now we have a little bit more from Olympus Elements. We have some low bass tones. And not only that, we have a little bit of reverb as well. Ooh, that compressor is working really hard, but it sounds kind of cool. More alchemy patch stuff coming along here. More alchemy patch stuff. And finally, our final alchemy patch here for sort of atmospheres and sound design. This is a patch, uh, it's one of my favorites, it's called, um, called Guitar Feedback. And if you kind of just hold down the sustain pedal and uh, just start playing some notes, they'll all kind of bleed together in this eerie fashion. It 
So you guys, there you have it. That is my template in a nutshell. And again, this is a starting point. This is a color palette. This is a place to begin exploring sonic creativity. So have fun with it. You can start the process of building your own template. But before you get there, head on over to the next lesson. And we're going to talk a little bit more about building a template out with some specifics regarding the orchestral sounds. Thank you